Tupperware, and there's no one there. And, <laughs> and it looks insane, but you're having a great time because no one can heckle you, no one can say this isn't very good. And I got on a unicycle, I strapped myself into handcuffs, and I got out of them with no one watching. <laughs> Gigs to no one. I've done a gig up a lamppost outside the Palladium. <laughs> outside, I played the Palladium inside and outside up a lamppost. <laughs> An entire gig. And how did the lamppost gig go? Lamppost gigs are excellent. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so I went to see you at your first hour in Edinburgh and I knew, I thought, I think, you know, we've found one. He's brilliant. And I knew then that you were just a brilliant comedian. You saw that first show? Yeah. When did you know? That I could do it. Yeah, you could really do it. Uh, I knew I could do it when somebody phoned up the club that I was regularly hosting and said, is he on tonight? And I thought, ooh, if someone's... They might up. have been trying to avoid you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I always really admired about you is you were always one to see how far you could push it. Right. I remember you... Sat, I, I was doing a, a club in Birmingham and writing new material every week, but I didn't have the courage to do it that new material down in London. And you took me to one side in, in the comedy store and said, no, you've got to do it. And I said, I just don't know if it's strong enough. You said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you die. But it's all about pushing it. It's all about going a stage further and taking risks. And it was a very inspirational talk because you really did do it. Well, it was, it was an interesting... Th I mean, I... I uh, yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> no, well, it was weird because you actually had to do a little bit of new material in the middle of your quite tight 20-minute set. Mm. And often when, when people are doing sets, they go, so this and this guy and hey, laughter, and this guy did this, laughter, this guy did this, laughter. Anyway, um, spacemen, what are they doing? And everyone will go, oh, he's doing new stuff. <laughs> yeah. Spacemen, I, uh, we don't have uh, spacemen in, in Britain. And the whole delivery would fall apart. And I found that the more that you were improvising, in a set, and you could make your actual style... I've tried to make my style, the improvising and the actual material, feel the same, so that no one can tell when I'm moving between it. And, and now I don't care if I'm moving between it. And I actually keep it molten. Because you know when you come up with a new bit of material, there's the, that early bit when you come up with a new bit of material, and you really like it, and you really... Because it's the first time you've heard it, the first few weeks that you've heard it. You know that feeling? Oh, yes, nothing uh, like it. Yeah, nothing like it. And the audience feels that, that energy. You could see it in a stand-up set when they've got a new piece, and then they go, oh, God, and... You know, I don't know, chickens. Why, yeah, why you, can't they rule the world? You can't wait to get it out you there. Yeah, and the audience feel that. And I thought, if you can keep that, because after a while it becomes locked down, you get it into a shape, it becomes concrete, and then it becomes a, like a, a, a religious prayer. It becomes a domesticated animal. Yeah, it? And, and it doesn't live so much. So I thought, always keep it molten, molten material, this idea. Always keep it like mercury, so that you don't actually try to lock anything down. In which case, you can actually get it beautiful, and then you keep changing it and make it worse. And then you can get it into another shape. It takes balls, man. As yes. a transvestite, I don't know about that. Yes. <laughs> Are you still a transvestite? Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen you in women's clothes for years. I'm wearing women's clothes now. Really? Oh. <laughs> oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I've done no, the whole interview. No, hang on, hang on. Women can actually wear all the clothes I am wearing, so I am actually wearing women's clothes. <laughs> but and you're it, wearing women's clothes. I mean, you, now you've brought it up. I, have you... Was it a phase? No, no, I was... I've been transvestite since I was four or five. I am I'm mainly boy, plus this extra girly bit. I don't know why, but I've analysed it down to that. You were one Football. of the early ladettes. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> no, I ask it because I, I wonder if once you've made it extremely public, maybe you've... You know, as I say, you're a man that needs new challenges all the time. Maybe you've taken on the challenge of public transvesticism and now the charm has gone. No, no, I'm, I'm still there. I'm a card-carrying transvestite. You know, I'm superhero transvestite. Captain transvestite, help us, transvestite. <laughs> and then you run so in... So that's it, so you don't feel you can stop doing it now, do you? Because you've got too many people depending on you in the transvestite No, well, people get angry when I, I don't wear a dress, but I didn't wear a dress in, in order that I had to wear a dress all the time. And I look more blokey, and you know I want to get roles in dramas. And if I turn up wearing makeup, then I can't do that. And well, and also there was a deal that we had that I would talk about my transvestism, and you talk about your Catholicism, and uh, you yes. haven't done that bit yet. No. <laughs> well, we had this. We made this deal on an aeroplane. I think we thought it was going to no, crash. We had it in the back. Of <laughs> I was. <laughs> I was. The, I, I wasn't uh, banking on the, the plane actually landing safely <laughs> when I said I'd do a stand-up show all about being a it, Catholic. No, it wasn't all about being Catholic. It's just that you are a devout Catholic. You go every Sunday, and I thought you should talk about it in your stand-up because I think it would, 
you know, the pearly gates, they, you know, knob jokes, and they'd say, well, <laughs> but you went every Sunday, so you're in. You know, it was just, it, it would give you that thing, because it's part of you. I agree, I've written about it. I'm out. out. <laughs> we made this deal, cause, and I said to Eddie, to be honest, I think your average comedy crowd would be a bit easier with transvesticism <laughs> than Roman Catholicism. <laughs> Hang on, no, no way! <laughs> yeah, I think, honestly, I, transvestism doesn't get bad press anymore. Well, that's maybe because I came out and stomped around in a dress for a. Oh, so it's well, it might help. It might have helped. Yeah. You're some sort of egomania. No, no, no. It's like, it didn't change the whole thing, but it definitely must have helped a little bit. You oh, know I'm sure it did. I'm not going to dwell on the transvesticism, but I, uh, when I saw you'd got a goatee, I took that to be the end of your transvestite. No, marriage. it's just that when I was playing Wayne in The Riches and the thing that I couldn't turn up in makeup because they wouldn't have given me that gig, and I am keep trying to get the next thing. And, and this tour I'm doing is more boy mode, then I can go back to girl mode in the next tour, and then... Bo- and then but you the- need to have a goatee. No, well, I just quite like doing a goatee. Well, look, you can't have it both ways, for God's sake. <laughs> yes, You can look I like can. Kenny Everett. <laughs> both ways. I'm doing it, I'm separating it out. Do you feel now that you've, you're at a stage where the, you feel there should be a message in your, in your show? It has got to a point where you can't just go out and talk a lot of stuff about cats with guns. That uh, <laughs> people say, well, where was all the meaning stuff? And I, and I accidentally put meaning into some other shows and so um, you, you, you try and I, I think one is, and then you, maybe you feel this as well, one is trying to you know, constantly shift that bar a little bit higher. And it gets tricky. And so this show I've developed for ages, um, trying to get different levels into the show. Or, or, or it doesn't have to have a message, but just something that could be thoughtful. And, and you come up with some points that, you know, that, you know I like, what I like doing is going back into old times and cavemen and giving them mo- modern sensibilities and cavemen going, look, we should use these rocks. They... It could be useful. Ah, you're just crazy with your new ideas, you know. And yeah. so the guy before the Stone Age began, the day before Stone I love the day before. I've done the day before fire began when his wife's saying, come and have your salad all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, stop spinning that twig. What are you doing? Oh, it's going to be brilliant. I love that the day before stuff, you know. Yes. The day before the wheel, you know, the day yes. before... I haven't done that one. This sounds less like a message, doesn't it? <laughs> no, but, no, but, it, no, but that I, is... I felt you were very keen to get across the fact that you were an atheist humanist. Is that no, what you call yourself? Well, I'm an atheist... What we, uh, a spiritual atheist, is what okay. I've decided. Um, um, I... Not really. I was just interested in, in, in looking at ideas and uh, we have searched for God throughout the history of human beings as we know it and maybe we've been looking for a God to explain things we don't understand and maybe there isn't an explanation. Maybe just stuff happens. Uh, but I like this. I believe in us. I don't believe in the bloke upstairs because I don't see a plan. I know what plans look like because I make some of them up in my head, and they tend to be, you know, plan. I press a button and a light comes on. That's a very simple plan. But you know, <laughs> there's none of those in the God thing. And then God moves in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. And I think, well, that's a that's a coverall. That's a that's a good line from the press department, isn't it? From, <laughs> Well, in the end, just stuff happens. And if you look at it and if plants and life and it just... Uh, things out there are beautiful and horrible and disgusting and wonderful and colour is horrible and why do we poo and pee? If you didn't have poo and pee, you wouldn't have poo and pee diseases. <laughs> <laughs> Stick that in your Catholicism. I would say... You I'll see it, anti-Catholic... Di- it's there. No, no, no. But what, not, what I would say... If I said, yeah, stick it in your hold-ups, <laughs> they'd boo and hiss. <laughs> I am the 69th most influential Roman Catholic in England, according to, really? the, according to the tablet magazine. Really? It said, even in that, I have to be 69th. There has to be, a, <laughs> there has to be an element of sauciness about my position. <laughs> so, for someone who's um, built a career largely on improvising... Um, Acting seems an unlikely second string to your bow because isn't acting about quite rigidly sticking to someone else's words? See, I imagine you'd find it to be something of a straitjacket. Uh, no, because I can still go away and do a stand-up tour and then I can come back and do the Riches or, or Valkyrie or something. And, and I do love films. I, as soon as I discovered that films had real people in and not just you know, gods who walked across the thing. I realised those were people you could be in it. I broke into film studios when I was a teenager. I, and again, in my standard planning long shot thing. You broke into film studios? Yeah. I, I even, I hitchhiked to, uh, from Sheffield University to Birmingham to try and phone Chris Tarrant 
to pretend to be his agent to get him to put me in OTT. <laughs> right. I, I used to do the longest, longest wild card, <laughs> do yeah. or die card. I'd say you were aiming quite low at the time. <laughs> No, it was an attempt to no, get into me- movies. No, OTT was the hottest thing going after yes. Tiswas, wasn't it? <laughs> but my point is I used to do very weird things. I, I worked out that Pinewood was a studios and it, was, it had a, uh, an address and so I took a train up there and, and bus and tube and walked up and asked if I could come in and get You just job. turned up at a film studio and asked yeah. for work? Yeah, when I was 15. And did that? They told me to piss off. <laughs> well, but uh, I broke it, then I went in the next entrance and then I did break in. Did you not do, is it just me did all this stuff? I thought everyone was doing this crazy. No. When people said they broke into films, I, I didn't think... <laughs> I didn't think they used a crowbar. <laughs> so, do you have any preference now? You said that acting was what you wanted to do. Yeah, if, if I had to choose, I would do film acting. Oh, for stand-up comedy? Yeah. I'm sad to hear you say that. I know, but I don't have to choose, so you don't have to be sad. Yes. <laughs> the American side of your career... Yes. Um, I, I assume that was a, a, a plan. Was, was that even in those early days when I used to watch you in South West London, were you thinking, I want to make it in America? Yes. Mm. Yeah, no, that was from Seven again. Really? It was, yeah, it was always... I love the idea. I want all British comedians. I want you to go and get America. I want everyone. I tell every stand-up comedian, go get America. Why? Because then we'll have a big party. <laughs> And then they'll say, oh, those British people, they do wonderful stuff. I don't know how, we do. well, in America as well, my God damn it, they'll say, my God, why haven't we got these, um, these British guys? The British invasion, it'd be nice to have that. It happened in bands, because before the Beatles, it didn't happen. And then after the Beatles, it, it was possible. And Ricky Gervais now got known, absolutely fabulous is known, and uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, who no one thinks is British, unfortunately, but, you know, he's doing well out there. And Python broke through years ago. And uh, I just say, go there, because all you've got to do is work your uh, testicles until they fall off. <laughs> and, yeah, it's just about grafting, you know, from my point of view. Or some people what, just gra- sail in there. Are we still talking about testicles? <laughs> testicles. Graft more testicles on, and then... <laughs> this guy's got balls, he's actually got seven of them. <laughs> I would say that the, the greatest... If the Beatles had Hamburg, what I had and what you had was the scene in London, even though you're from Birmingham, it, it was the London scene, if you count comedy clubs, in, in New York there's about 10, 12, LA there's about 8, London there's about 70. And it is just amazing. Hamburg for the Beatles, we've got that in London. And it's still there, it's been there for about 20 years. Mm. We have the most amazing stuff. And people come from South Africa to do stand-up here. And uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada... Um, I bet you Indian people are going to start coming in because there's 200 million English speakers and we're starting to do stand-up over there. The Scandinavians are coming in. Henning Vane, this German comedian, is playing here. Isn't known in Germany, he's playing here. Um, it's, it's such a great melting pot. Well, I, I did a, a film, uh, a little scene from a film with you a few months ago and there was a lot of comedians in that and we sat around as if we were in the comedy store dressing room in 1989. Yes. Um, and I felt that you really enjoyed it. In fact, after you were very keen to go into a club and not let it end. Right. Do you miss that kind of comedy community? Because I imagine you're more of a, of a loner figure now. I, I am, uh, yeah. I, I was always was a kind of lone wolf, lone transvestite. <laughs> yes. Wolf. I don't know how this works. But, um, yeah, I was always doing my own weird route. But I, I really like people. I go to the comedy store and I just hang out at the back and... Yeah, and still, chat to people. You still do that now. And yeah, and I tell people, don't, I say, don't do that. And I think, I, I, I give advice and I think, God, do what, you? what a asshole I am. <laughs> they must hate me. Yeah, but I do. I, I, Have you become a, a comedy elder statesman? Well, I've become a real pain in the ass, I think. <laughs> I, do, I do love, I, I want everyone to do well because then it keeps me on my edge. And then, you know, the younger stand ups coming up and I'm thinking, well, that's great. They're pushing out this way, they're doing it in different ways. Mm. I want them all to do America. You said you think you, that you think like an American. What did you mean by that? What I mean is I think like a, an economic migrant. You know, all those people who went to America in the late 1700s, 1800s, I would have been one of those. I definitely would have been on that boat. The adventure part of it, the, the, the grind, the tough thing, I would have, that fight, I would have liked that fight for the new world. And it, you know, obviously, it turned into a, a different thing, but um, I'm there with that mentality. It's giving a damn and caring about people but it's also, how can we build it? How can we change it? How can we make it new? 
coming up with new ideas. And I've said this, and America's taken it too far. I did a bit of stand-up on this thing, because they go, it's the pursuit of happiness, and you pursue it. I was saying to Americans, you pursue it, you pursue it, like, come on, happiness. Chase, chase happiness, kill it, shoot it, strap it to it. <laughs> you know, and, and they you pursue... You happiness rugs in your house. Yeah, they shoot happiness and strap it down, and then, and then eat it. We were at happiness. Oh, there's no more happiness. So, um, but America can go too far, but I like that economic migrant thing. And you can get that in Britain, you can get that in your anywhere around the world because I, I think now the new European young kids mentality that I love that that's why I'm very positive about Europe we can we can make beautiful things from I, I keep saying from Alexander the Great to World War Two we made wonderful things in Europe and paintings and inventions and stuff and and then every 50 years we'd say hang on we haven't killed anyone yet have we <laughs> let's kill the guys with the blue hats the blue hats we hated them surely <laughs> and then we murder the blue hats and then we carry on and make more things so I just like I like making things uh, when are you, um, when are you going to take on the challenge of British television? Do you think? Because you did a, a pilot many, many years ago called Cows, yeah, which was a sitcom about cows. Yeah, I, I, I think you'll agree. We didn't want to muck about with the title. No. <laughs> um, and then you didn't do any more of those, and haven't done a sitcom since. No, that's what? been part of the plan of, of just to do not do any comedy, so that. I could try and do drama. I have this theory that if you get really into people's brains in comedy, and my comedy is very kind of buzzy, and yours is too, that if you go and do some dramatic acting, if you push into drama, that people have a problem. You have this baggage of the fact that you might go, hey, let's invade Spain with chickens. <laughs> yeah, and, and so they can't take you seriously in a, in a thing. So I try to restrict my stand-up, and I didn't do a sitcom, and I didn't do a comedy show. But doesn't the fact that you're a stand-up comedian make it more difficult to get serious parts. Absolutely. But uh, that was my only way of getting off the ground. Once I got off the ground, I tried to suppress it as much as I could. And, uh, and I've pushed to do drama. And in America, I didn't have any of the beginning phase, so I just arrived doing that. And it's a huge country of 300 million, so um, I could keep that more lower level. And then people gave me the benefit of the doubt and gave me chances. And I did Dare Death of Joe Egg on Broadway, and that went very well, and got awards for that. So... So I, I was, they've been good at put, helping me go into drama, giving me chances. Mm. I didn't do drama school, I did, I did accounting and financial management. <laughs> yeah, the plan has changed somewhat, I take it over the years. You've got you to you grind, sometimes you've got to grind a gig out. You know, you've done that. We did that gig in Birmingham at, in that, um, in that uh, Here disco. Here we go, now. this is the two old men in the comedian's <laughs> rest home. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did a gig in a discotheque. <laughs> Um, against but, a mirrored back wall. But no, fact, I did it, you didn't do it, you backed I out. I backed out. I, I did a tactical retreat. You're allowed to do those? Um, <laughs> Eddie said, you can have my fee, I'm not going on. Yeah. <laughs> when I first went on, some people actually tried dancing early on <laughs> to my act. And I felt, I felt a certain rhythm kick into my voice, which wasn't normally there, to help them. But it, it didn't work out. <laughs> Another uh, thing I read, which I doubted the veracity of, but may be true, that you'd, you'd actually considered um, standing as an MP. No, I've said I will. You honestly are going to yeah, do that? Yeah, in 10 or 15 years. I give these long lead announcements so everyone gets really <laughs> ready. I wanted to test the water to see if everyone went... <laughs> you fool, you... So I said, yeah, either MEP, MP or, or uh, Bishop of uh, Durham. <laughs> Uh, or, you know, there's, uh, the Mayor of London one is there as well. But, you know, it, it's, it's later. I'll do it later. Surely, having been a film star, and a, I know it worked for Ronald Reagan and uh, Schwarzenegger, but wouldn't you find being a politician slightly dull? I don't think dull is the right word. It's not I, just I about it's grand speeches, is it? It's about... Is it? I don't, I don't think it is. <laughs> so you just turn up and go, and then on Tuesday the 29th, we're making a new soap powder called Steve. And... Yeah. <laughs> um, I think there's probably less scope for improvisation. Yeah. Uh, I found that, you know, if you're... Because I used to be very waffly, you know... And, 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 really? And, yeah. So, when talking what about happened? politics, well, like, you need oh, okay. to actually be very concrete in what you're saying, but you can put jokes in, but it has to be at the end. It has to be at the end well, of the Well, there are program. jokes in the House of Commons. There are. They're often very poor. I know. <laughs> it's something I want to do, because I, I, you know, I do like people. I think people have a... They, a lot of people struggle and fight to, to get a decent life, and we've come a long way in Britain and in Europe and in the developed countries, and there's people in the developing countries still really struggling and having a tough time, people living on a dollar or two dollars a day. 
And, uh, but you will be a millionaire MP. Uh, yeah, I could well be. But, you know, I don't, I'm not saying everyone should give away their money. I'm just no, saying I want everyone... I just to... want to make that clear before we move on. I want everyone to be millionaires, you know? Oh, I want okay. everyone to get America. I want, everyone, I want everyone to get into a good position. It's not that everyone should give it away. I'm, not, I'm a social democrat. I'm a radical moderate. I believe in... I think you could be a politician. <laughs> You've Radical. covered all the bases right I want there. some very balanced ideas, and then you really go but for it. it like... But it's, it's a serious Radical. proposition. Yeah. Can anyone say what they're going to do in 15 years' time? No, that's why I've said 10 to 15 years. No, <laughs> <laughs> and it might never be. It might never come, because it might be better to stay out and I might have more... Because I'm going to have to take apart the career. All that earning that I can do will go and I, I tend to use that to just facilitate getting something else going and I, I, I like that you know because I was struggling for a long time mm. and um, um, you know I've worked my backside off for it and uh, I, that would have to go I may be you know I, I, I feel like I've already talked you out of it no I've already thought about this I, I'm said I'm going to do it and, I, and I, pr I most probably will I don't think I could go through it without trying it mm. so you're about to go on tour yes I am. And are you excited about that? Nervous about it? Nervous? Do you do nerves? Not very much. No, no. I can't be bothered with nerves. <laughs> no. I think that's probably been a big help to both of us, hasn't it? Yeah, well, I find that no, people say, oh, it's good to be nervous. No, it's good to be throwing up. Before. No, I, I think. No, I like I to wander on the stage and go, hello. Cool, what a big room this is. <laughs> this is the O2, isn't you it? You know, I remember a comedian saying that to me. We watch you at Jongler's Comedy Club in... Uh, in South London, and he said to me, I, I don't get it with Eddie Izzard. He said, every rule says that when you go on stage, you've got to hit them with a big laugh straight away so they know you're funny. He said, he comes on, he messes about, he's going, oh. He said, I don't, I just don't. He said, I don't get it. Well, I, I did that just to break up the rules. Because yes. I found I know you did. The rules was, is actually come on stage and be confident. And I, and I used to go on stage and just go, ah. And just make a song, or go, Pong, or just make a noise, because that wasn't the first joke that was supposed to get everyone going. <laughs> I used to do one that was, uh, I'd say, oh, it was my birthday last night. It's my early, first, I think the first joke that kind of worked. I said, it's my birthday last night. Oh, we had a party, and we went to a pub, and we had a few jars, and we went on someone else's place, had a few jars, back to my place, had a few jars, and then I thought, oh, that's enough jam for me. <laughs> <laughs> Which got a laugh, and then... <laughs> That was... That, I really like that. Oh, one. you... <laughs> I must say, you peaked early. <laughs> so, look, um, I've been a fan of yours for a long time, and you are a living example of um, what courage um, can achieve. Twin with ability, but I've always thought you were the bravest and most courageous comic I've seen. Much respect to you, ladies and gentlemen, Eddie Izzard. Thank you.